All right, so with that, you have now met uh, three of the four couples that are going to be guest speaking here at our marriage conference coming up in two weeks. So I want to really encourage you, if you haven't already signed up, go ahead and do that online or in the church app. And here's what's unique about this year, as you can probably already tell. Uh, we're not bringing in a professional you know, who, who goes from church to church or from conference to conference. Hey, those are great. I enjoy hearing them. Uh, and they're certainly polished. There is going to be nothing about this year's conference that is polished at all. Uh, this is real, like real-life couples who are sharing with you, with us, their real-life experiences, what God has done in them, through them, and with their marriage. And listen, I want you to be here to hear everything that they have to say. Uh, that way, you don't fall prey to the lie of the enemy that says, that you and your spouse are the only ones dealing with this or with that. It's just not true. Or don't believe the lie that says, well, you know, you're not going to make it or this is beyond repair. Don't even try. Not true. These are couples who some of them have gone through uh, some really traumatic experiences in their life. Some of their own doing and some it's just, it's just life. It's what we all have to deal with, and God has brought them through it. God has used them, and he's now uh, given them a platform this year to share that story to encourage us. Do you have to be married to come to the marriage conference? No. It doesn't cost you a thing either. So married, not married, engaged, want to be married one day, don't want to be married. You're all welcome at the marriage conference. You say, well, why would, if I'm not going to be married, come to the marriage conference? Volunteer. We always need extra hands doing little things here and there. Or you may hear something that later on in life, maybe even the next week at work, you can pass along to a friend who is struggling in their relationship. And you can share hope and encouragement with them. So sign up, sign up, sign up. A couple of other things I want to share before we jump into the message. Be praying for our students. Uh, they've been on their winter retreat since Friday, coming back later today, and just want to brag on them a little bit, Joel and the group, man, they have done a fantastic job. Uh, they took 43 students with them uh, to the winter retreat, that's not including adults in any way, 43 students who wanted to go on this trip and were looking for life change, and so I'm so excited, so proud of them, and so be praying as they make their way back home later this afternoon. And talking about numbers that we can celebrate, we just baptized uh, right after the first service. That's why some of you were trying to come in and, and couldn't find a parking spot because things went a little longer in the first service with baptism and all that. Uh, we baptized, I think, five or six people this morning. And, and I just want to share that with you in context. So we're only in February. We've got the rest of the, of the year to go. And we, over the past four years, have shown tremendous uh, you know, success in seeing people come to Christ and take their next step in baptism. I was sent a report here just a few weeks ago of the North Carolina Baptist. It's produced by them every year. And so they also gave some numbers nationwide. But just talking about the 2,300 or so Southern Baptist churches in North Carolina, um, in 2022... They baptize, these congregations baptize at an average rate of 2.42 individuals per 100 in attendance. Don't ask me what a .42 person is. I have no idea. But about two and a half people per 100 in attendance uh, in 2022. In that same year, New Life doubled at, or, or baptized at double that rate, 4.2. In 2021, the year before, we were at 9.6, so almost 10 people per 100 in attendance. And last year, we baptized 38 people who gave their life to Christ, and that put us at a rate, again, depending on the attendance, at 8.2 per 100. That's incredible, guys. That is absolutely fantastic that God is moving in that way in our church. Let's not take that for granted. Every time we have baptism, let's celebrate that. Let's thank God for that, that we're seeing people make those decisions. Uh, again, those, that, that nine number and that eight number, 
that is itself almost double the amount of baptisms that are average for any Baptist church across the country. Y'all should celebrate that. Like, th- yes, thank you. Don't want that to fall on deaf ears, right? The Andrea being my cheerleader, appreciate that, you know? You know? Um, and last thing, speaking of like coming in and trying to find a place to park, uh, we're going to alleviate some of that over the next couple weeks. Uh, we're going to double the lower parking lot down there, so maybe that won't be quite as a big a problem. Uh, today, seating it not as big a problem as it has been in the last couple weeks, but uh, to try to help with that, I know if you're checking in your kids and you're running a little late, sometimes if worship has already started, it, it might be difficult to find a place to sit um, while worship is going on and everybody's standing up. Uh, so what we need, and I'm asking you personally, we need about four volunteers, at least for this service. We need about four volunteers who will be, I don't know what to call them, but aisle ushers. What that means is we need you, like two on this side and two on this side, to to literally stand in the aisle and know, okay, for these first four or five rows in the center and on this section over here, there are five or six or two open seats. Same thing over on this side. And the, the person standing back there at the back, you know where there are seats. And so as people are coming in and they're doing this, looking for a seat, you can say, hey, Got two seats right here. Or if they're a family of four, hey, got four seats over here. You may have to usher them all the way up front here. Because let me tell you, where there's seats, always, right here, right here. This is is like spitting range. So I guess maybe we should back that up a little bit. But but we need that help so that it doesn't congest the back of the auditorium and make it difficult for people to uh, find a seat. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, again, that's a weekly thing, so obviously the more people we get to volunteer for that, uh, we can put you on a rotation so that you're not committed to that every single week. Uh, but for starters, we need at least at least four people for this service. And so if you want to help with that um, or anything else, you can email Pastor Eric at eric at newlife247.com, eric at newlife247.com. Um, I grew up in this church where there was a man named Lynn, and I'm not going to tell you his, his last name because you might know him, but he had a nickname. Everybody called him Lion Lynn. Now you think, well, I don't envy that at all, you know, hate it for that guy. It, he wasn't called that as a way to insult him. Most people in the church that called him Lion Lynn, was just, they were just joking just making light of things. However, you need to understand that you don't get a nickname like that because of your upstanding honesty. Like, he earned it. Uh, Lynn was a salesman. And from all things that I could see, he was a pretty good one. Like, from, I mean, I was 12, 11, 12, 13 years old, and I always looked at Lynn as sort of like the picture of success. Uh, he usually drove nice vehicles. He dressed really nice. He always had like gold jewelry on. And, and so I took from that, he's probably a pretty good salesman. But to be a really good salesman, sometimes you, well, you know, they handle the truth a little recklessly. They might not lie outright, but you sort of stretch the truth, maybe not uh, completely forthcoming with all the information. And maybe you know somebody like that. That you would say, some people, you're just going to say, well, they're just an outright liar. They're completely deceptive. What's, you know. But then there's others in your life. Maybe it's a friend or a family member or somebody at work that they're just a little dishonest. Maybe not quite as trustworthy as you would like. Or you just know someone in general. You just think, man, that person, they just give me, just give me that vibe. I th- they're a little sketchy. We probably all know somebody like that. As shocking as it may come to you, the individual that we're going to talk about today in this third week of our series, The Hall of Faith, would be in that category. Not completely honest or trustworthy. Now, if you've missed the past couple of weeks, we have begun a seven-week study of some Old Testament characters, some, some names of fame in the Old Testament. People, most of them who are listed in 
Hebrews chapter 11. That's a New Testament letter. And in Hebrews chapter 11, that particular chapter is often referred to as God's hall of faith. These are some incredible individuals, and we're studying uh, parts of their lives so what, to find out what can we learn about them, from them, from their life experiences, but most of all, from their faith. And so we started out a couple weeks ago talking about Noah. In Genesis chapter 6, Noah uh, we described as a man who was warned by God. Warned of what? A pending global catastrophe. A flood that would literally cover the earth. It wasn't just a, a local uh, event. It was a, a global flood in which God judged the sinfulness of humanity. And Noah was forewarned of that, built an ark, and then was able to save his family and anyone else who would have wanted to board. But unfortunately, it was just he and his family. We moved on from there and last week talked about Abraham. Abraham is sometimes referred to as the father of the Hebrews. And Abram, which was his former name, Abram or Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, received a promise from God, a call to leave his country of origin and go to a land that God would later show him. And there, he would become great. And he would have many descendants. So many, in fact, that God said, if you could count the number of stars in the sky or the number of the grains of sand on the beach, then you could count the number of your descendants. And you know what Abraham did? He went. Wherever God said to go, he went. Abraham, that characterizes his life, was a man who went for God. Today we're going to look at a few lessons from one of his grandsons, a guy by the name of Jacob. And in general, I would say Jacob is a guy who wrestled with God. And you might even uh, know that he actually did that in Genesis chapter 32. But his life in general seems to be an illustration of one who wrestles, one who struggles with God. Something else that's interesting about Jacob is the fact that he is well known for being a deceiver. Not completely honest, but yet, this is the interesting thing, he's still listed there in Hebrews 11 in God's hall of faith. Gives hope to the rest of us, right? I mean, here is a recorded liar, and everybody knows it, but yet he was a man of faith. And so I think that gives a little bit of hope for all of us. And here's what Hebrews chapter 11, verse 20 and 21 say about Jacob. It says, by faith, Isaac, which is Jacob's father, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Now, I want to give you a little background here on this family. Isaac, you might know, is the son of Abraham by his wife, Sarah. Why is that important? Well, because Abraham had another son named Ishmael who was by his maidservant, Hagar. Isaac, though, was the son who almost got slaughtered. He was almost sacrificed by his father uh, before God provided a ram to take his place there in Genesis 22. Later on in his life, Isaac re uh, married Rebekah, but for whatever reason, Rebekah couldn't have children. And so Isaac prayed on behalf of his wife to the Lord to open her womb so that they could have children. And God did. She became pregnant with boys, twin boys by the name of Esau and Jacob. Now here's something interesting. During Rebekah's pregnancy, it seems that something out of the ordinary was happening. Something strange, something abnormal. Now even though she had never been pregnant before, all of this was new to her. Now you ladies are going, you're going to understand exactly what I'm talking about. I certainly don't have first-hand experience. I've never been pregnant. And men can't get pregnant, okay? So let's just say it. Why do we even have to? But even if it's your first time with child, 
If something's not right, you know it. You know it. It's, it's just like this, this God-given instinct. If something is, is going on that, that's out of the ordinary, it, it seems that, that mothers can, can pick up on that. All right, well, what was going on? Verse 22 of Genesis chapter 25 says, The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Something's going on. With these babies inside of my womb, it doesn't seem right. And so she began to pray about it. And now those of you who have experienced pregnancy, you might be thinking, there's nothing strange about that. I mean, the babies jostled inside of her. What, what's so strange about it? That's, that's what babies do. They, they kick. They move around. They flip. They treat your bladder and other organs like they're trampolines. And just think, if there are two, if there are two in there at the same time, I'm sure there are moments when it feels like the Ringling Brothers, like putting on a show inside the womb. But, but here's the thing. The word jostled, the babies jostled with each other, is a translation of a Hebrew word that literally means to crush, to bruise, to struggle or oppress. In other words... What Rebecca felt was as if war was going on in her womb. And so she began to pray, God, what is happening here? Why is this going on? And he responds in verse 23 saying, Two nations are in your womb, and two people from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. That is a prophecy and promise concerning the future of her two sons, Esau and Jacob. And you might notice that it sort of breaks from tradition. Traditionally, uh, the firstborn was recognized as, uh, we'll use the term, sort of superior. They were first in line for several things. But God said, the younger will be recognized as first. The older will serve the younger. In other words, the younger one will be seen as superior. But from both of these two would come great nations. The nation of Edom and the nation of Israel. From Edom, uh, or from Esau comes the nation of Edom, and from Jacob comes the nation of Israel. Well, just as God said, the older would serve the younger, during the reign of King David, the Edomites were subjugated to Israel, meaning that they had to serve them. They were used sort of as a forced uh, labor supply. Uh, but these two twin nations were in constant conflict with each other. They were always, always fighting. But more than all of that, in this response from the Lord, what it ultimately means is that the covenant that God had made with their grandfather Abraham and that was passed down to their father Isaac would then be passed down to not Esau, who was the physically firstborn, but to Jacob. Well, that covenant involves, if you remember from the, the message about Abraham, a future nation, you know, the descendants, a nation, a, a land that they would uh, take control of, and ultimately the coming of the Messiah. And what God is saying here is all of that will come through Jacob, not Esau. Now, that doesn't mean that Esau didn't have a bright future. He certainly did. As we said, a great nation also came from his descendants. It's just that the future of Jacob and his lineage would bring about the Messiah, which makes it especially significant. Now, I want you to read Jacob's life this week, because we don't have time to go into all of it. And all of his experiences and, and everything that God did in and through him, you can start at Genesis 25, uh, which is sort of where we're going to camp out today, and read through the rest of the book of Genesis 
and, and it will absolutely blow your mind. There's way more there than we have time to cover. Uh, but for this morning, I want to sort of just focus in on and emphasize one aspect, one aspect of Jacob's life. And I want us to, to really take home this big lesson, one general lesson that I think we can all learn from the life and actions of Jacob, and that is how not to get ahead. That's a huge lesson. Jacob is, a, is an example in Scripture of how not to get ahead. Now, condense it down. What God said to his mother, Rebecca, and would later on affirm to him personally is this. Jacob, you will get ahead. You will be first. You will be successful. You will lead a successful life. You will be the second born as if you were the first. That's a tremendous promise. But the problem is, from the very beginning and throughout Jacob's life, he is always trying to get ahead, to attain God's promise on his own personal you know, timeline. He's trying to make things happen for himself when he thinks they should happen. He's trying to push the needle forward instead of relying and just trusting in God, in God's promises, and in God's timing. And see, when he begins to do this, when he tries to move the ball forward uh, in his own timetable, by his own means, that's when this tendency toward treachery begins to play in. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to get ahead. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be successful. However, Jacob's actions, I think, should cause us to pause. They should be a, a reason for us to examine our own motives, our own actions, to make sure the how is in proper order. How we are trying to get ahead. How we are trying to be successful. Making sure that it's always as it should be. Honorable to the Lord and in accordance with His word and His will. And so I'm going to highlight for you three events in Jacob's life that I believe illustrate how not to do that. How not to get ahead. And it begins with his birth. It reveals that one of the ways that Jacob seemed to try to get ahead was by supplanting. You're, just go ahead and write that word down. You may have never heard it before. Just hang in here with me a few minutes and you'll, you'll totally understand. Supplanting. I want to go back to Genesis chapter 25 where Rebecca, uh, God told Rebecca there were two nations in her womb sort of fighting it out. Let's continue that conversation uh, in verse 24. We read, when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. Uh, the, the Hebrew translation for, for Esau uh, means hairy. So I don't know, maybe that was his nickname. Um, he was also at times just called Red. And that's because the word for Edom is similar to the word that would mean Red. All right, so that's Esau. After this, verse 26, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, and so he was named Jacob. I'll explain that in a second. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up. Did I hear somebody say, shh? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Uh, he was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter and the man and a man of open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for a wild game, loved Esau. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute here. These parents played favorites? Yeah, they did, just like you. I, I mean, at times, we're, we can all you know, be a little guilty of that. I can certainly admit it because neither of my daughters are in here today. You know, but there are some times when you, when you have a tendency to favor one or the other. It may be because of the circumstances or whatever. Listen, yes, it's dysfunctional. It doesn't make it right. It just makes it reality. 
We all live in dysfunctional families. We all came from dysfunctional families. If you're saying, I didn't come from a dysfunctional family, my family's not dysfunctional, it's because you're the dysfunctional one. <laughs> and like no one has, has the guts to tell you, okay? It's just, just a common problem that we all have. Uh, but let's zoom in here on, on verse 26, where it said, After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, and so he was named Jacob. All right, so the name Jacob in Hebrew means heel grabber, the one who grasps the heel. That phrase was in the culture an idiom for someone who is deceptive, a deceiver. All right, if you need a little refresher in English and, and lit literature, an idiom is a phrase, you know, a combination of words, where what is meant by that combination of words is not the same as the literal definition or meaning of the words themselves. It's the best way I know to, uh, to explain it or define it. And those of you who are literature, English teachers probably say, man, you butchered that. But it's close. For example, everybody in here knows what it means. If I were to say, if it was raining outside really, really hard, if I were to say, man, it's raining cats and dogs. Well, you know that I'm not saying that literal animals are falling from the sky, right? Everybody knows that that is a, a way to say it's raining extremely hard outside. It's an idiom. Well, again, in this culture, to say he, she, or they are is an, a heel grabber, it means that that person is deceptive. And so that's the name he was given. Uh, another definition of the word uh, Jacob or the name Jacob is supplanter. And a supplanter is someone who takes or, or attempts to take the place of someone else by deceptive means. They're usually trying to take the place of someone else by deceptive means. And so he was given this name because he seemed to have a tendency, even from the beginning, to get ahead, even if it meant taking the place of someone else. By knocking them out of contention, by pulling them down, all of that began at the womb. And here, this is key to remember. As you read Jacob's story this week and as we talk about him this morning, the key to remember is that God had already promised Jacob what he so desperately desired. But yet he still felt the need to try to do things on his own timetable instead of wait and trust God. Now listen, there are, I think, ample passages of evidence in the Scripture that would lead us to believe uh, not only does God truly love us, I think that's apparent, but that he wants to bless us. He wants to see his people succeed, to get ahead. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest, an abundant life. That is very clear. But nowhere in Scripture are we instructed to tear other people down. To get ahead by trying to hold someone else back or trying to become first or, or put ourselves above others by usurping other people. In fact, if we go to the scripture, uh, particularly what Paul wrote to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2 where he outlined the model, the living example of Jesus, what we find there is that the way up is down and the way to succeed is to serve, not supplant not be deceptive but that was Jacob the supplanter always trying to get ahead by knocking someone else out of contention or out of the way another example of how not to get ahead that we find uh, Jacob implementing is uh, that of shortcutting shortcutting let's pick up here in verse uh, 29 of Genesis 25 uh, 25 and what I'm about to read here will likely be familiar to some of you who have read this story before. It says in verse 29 that once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he's also called Edom. Remember, red. 
His skin was sort of red. He liked red stew. Favorite color was red. Eat them. All right, Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore on oath to him, selling him his birthright, uh, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now, even if you've never heard that part of the story before, at first reading, you can probably tell, man, something, something ain't quite right here. This seems odd to me. And what's the deal with the birthright? All right, so the birthright or the right of the firstborn was something that was extremely valuable in this culture. Both of these individuals, Esau and Jacob, would have been, would have been highly aware of this. They would have this information. They knew it. But as we just read, it said Esau despised it. That does not mean uh, he despised it in the sense that he hated it or he loathed it or you know, that he resented being the firstborn. What it means is that he simply treated it with contempt. At this particular moment, wherever he was in his place in life, he treated the birthright as if it had no value. He made light of something that was very serious. You see, sometimes I think we, we read too much into this exchange uh, pastors and teacher of the, teachers of the scripture will go to some extremes and you know, try to get too creative with the story here and, and make it say things that aren't really there. For example, I've always heard it uh, said, like Esau came in from this hunt and he's, he's like literally starving to death. Well, I mean, come on. And, and like, that's the reason why he swapped this soup for superiority because he had no other option or you know he he it was his only means of survival listen you're talking to a guy who loves to eat often and a lot and i will say to jessica sometimes you know i'm starving you know it's 4 30 <laughs> and uh you know i like to eat at five and she's like it'll be ready like just hold on and i'm like well Okay, I can give it another five minutes. But if not, i got to have a snack to hold me over. You know? Like, I feel like I'm about to die. Am I literally about to fall out and, you know, my spirit leave my, my body? No, that's not going to happen. And, and so I can relate to Esau. He comes in. He's thinking, man, I, I'm literally feeling like I'm starving to death. I'm so hungry and so this is not, though, a literal thing, a literal starving. It's more of a, a picture of the attitude of his heart, how, how he's thinking in the moment. He, he smells this great, you know, delicious soup. Probably he's had it before. He knows how good it is. And he says to his brother, give me some of that soup. I mean, just one bowl. Hold me over till dinner. And Jacob says, oh, okay, but you got to sell me your birthright. To which Esau says, well, what's the big deal? Who cares? I mean, we're all going to die anyway. What good is a birthright to me? So, you know, have it if you want. But what we need to understand is that what he treated in that moment so lightly and, and with contempt is a really big deal. Passages like, I'm not going to read this, but Deuteronomy 21, verse 17, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, they both reveal that having the birthright uh, gave both material and spiritual blessing. On the material side, the firstborn, the one who had the birthright, would get double the inheritance of any other sibling. So that's one advantage. But there were also spiritual benefits as well because the one with the birthright would eventually become recognized as the head of the family and the spiritual leader upon the death of the father. Now, 
take that and place it in the context of this particular family. Remember, God had made a covenant with these boys' grandfather, Abraham, and told him, I am going to bless you, and I am going to make you into a great nation. This land that I've brought you to, look north, south, east, and west, it's all yours. This is my covenant with you. Land and descendants, seed and soil. That covenant, that promise was later passed down from Abraham to Isaac and then would eventually be passed down to one of Isaac's sons. And typically following the the customary pattern, the firstborn. So now we can see that this is a big deal. It determined, the birthright determined who would be the inheritant of the covenant of God. And that covenant, again, not only involved land, people, and an eventual nation, but it involved the coming Messiah. And unlike his brother, Jacob saw the value in that, and he wanted it. You might think, well, wait a minute here. Didn't he technically already have it? You people are so smart. I can't pull anything over on you. Yes. We read that at the beginning, right? Before they were even born, God had already said the the second born would be as the first. The, The older would serve the younger. He already had it. It doesn't matter whether it was according to traditional pattern or customs or not. It certainly didn't have anything to do with Jacob's personal character. He didn't earn that blessing. He didn't earn that position. It all was in accordance with the providential plan and purpose of God for his life. God told Rebekah, and I'm assuming she told her husband Isaac. Later, God would affirm to to Jacob that he would be first. He would be ahead But it seems that Jacob never wanted to wait for God. He never wanted to trust God's timing. He always wanted to try to expedite things. And so in this instance, he attempted to take a shortcut. Now, did it actually accomplish anything? Did it actually move things forward? No. It didn't really benefit him at all. In fact, I'm going to show you here in a few minutes how it worked to his disadvantage. One commentator uh, pointed out that Martin Luther, who's you know well-known uh, reformer in Christian history, made this point about that particular event that we just read, the whole uh, exchange uh, superiority for soup thing. Martin Luther drew attention to the fact that it was not a valid transaction. For the simple fact that Jacob, in his estimation, was trying to purchase what was already his. And Esau was trying to sell something that didn't really belong to him. But you see, that's the temptation when it comes to shortcutting. Things don't always seem and look uh, the way that they really are. We get confused. We get a little anxious, we get impatient, we want to get what we want, even if, even if in our head somewhere, maybe lost back there in the back of our brain somewhere, we know that God has already made that promise. God has already said he will do this or he will do that, but again, he's not doing it now or he's not doing it fast enough and so we want to expedite the process. Well, that's never profitable. It's never helpful. It reminds me of of what Jesus experienced in Luke chapter 4 when he was tempted much in the same way. You see, Jesus knew that we were going to be going through this. We would face this kind of temptation. And so he endured it. He faced that challenge himself. We read there in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus, led by Satan himself up to a high pinnacle, was shown all of the kingdoms of the world in all of their splendor and the authority. And here's what Satan said. If you will just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all this. All of this will be yours. And now, notice, it wasn't 
It wasn't a temptation to bow down and worship him or, or give him glory forever. It was just this one time. If you will just do this in this instance, you never have to do this ever again, and I'll give you all of this. But you see, all of that was what Jesus already had coming to him. Here's what David wrote. This is a prophetic piece of poetry here in Psalm 110, verse 1, concerning the Messiah. It says, The Lord, Yahweh, says to my Lord, my Master, sit at my right hand until. Until. So there's a time frame here. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. How would that be accomplished? How would God do that? How would God bring all the kingdoms and people of the earth into submission to Jesus? Well, through the cross. See, the temptation there in Luke chapter 4, all authority, all kingdoms, all glory, all splendor, all honor, it, it could be yours now. You can have all that now if you'll just worship me in this moment. In other words, get what you already have coming to you. What I already know and you already know is to be yours without the pain, without the weight, without the suffering, without the embarrassment. It's a shortcut. But you see, every time we are tempted to take a shortcut, we are being tempted to trade what's important for what's immediate. Be it our integrity, our reputation, our character, our relationships, our fellowship with the Father himself. It is all on the line when we're tempted to take a shortcut. When we're, when we're trying to achieve what's already been promised. But God just said, wait. So Jacob would often try to, to get ahead by supplanting and by shortcutting. And then there's this third example of how not to do things. And, and that is by Jacob's scheming. You see how all of these sort of relate to one another, tied into one another. Later on, in total disregard to the promise of God, Jacob, with the help of, and get this, at the behest of his own mother. Remember, Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob. These two, Rebekah and Jacob together, devised a scheme to deceive his father into blessing him as the firstborn instead of his brother Esau. So Genesis 27 opens with Isaac, the father, admitting, Hey, I'm old, I'm weak, I'm feeble, I got bad eyesight, and I'm pretty sure that I probably don't have much longer here on this earth. Like Things are drawing to a close here. And in accordance with, again, custom, with tradition, he calls in, not Jacob, the secondborn, but Esau. Again, the physically firstborn. With the intent to give him the blessing of the firstborn, the birthright. But he says, listen, I, I, it's time for me to bless both of you, Esau, you're first, but go out, get some game, make me a, a, a meal, and then I'll give you the blessing. Well, while Esau is out hunting is when Isaac or uh, Jacob and Rebekah start scheming. They devise a plan to cook Isaac's favorite meal and then to use his deteriorating senses against him, his bad eyesight. And so they even go so far as to take like goat's hair and put it on the arms of Jacob so that he feels like Esau. Remember? Esau, the name means hairy. So he wants to feel a lot more like Harry. Put the goat's hair on him. He went to, they went to Esau's closet, got some clothes, put those on him so that he smells like Esau. Remember, he's a guy who likes to be outdoors, likes hunting and fishing. You know, loving every minute of it. Y'all don't listen to country music, huh? Okay. He's an outdoors guy. Um, Jacob is more of a homebody. He's a mama's boy. He likes to cook, likes to sew, you know, things like that. I, I don't know about the sewing part. But, uh, but he likes it at home. And, and maybe he's got skin that's soft to the touch. I like soft skin, you know. 
it's, it's all good, but I'm glad you guys are lighthearted this morning. But this is all, again, a, an attempt to be deceptive. And so Jacob goes in with his dad's favorite meal. He presents it him and himself before his father as if he was Esau. And, you know, at first, Isaac's like, wait a minute. Something doesn't seem right. Like, come a little closer. And he, and he touched him, and he felt the hairy arms. He smelled him. He's like, no. Yeah. And, and he's like, you feel like, you feel like Esau. You smell like Esau, but you got the voice of Jacob. Like, he knew something wasn't up, but, again, he probably chalked it up. Ah, I'm getting old. You know, my hearing is not as good as it used to be. And so he blessed Jacob with the blessing of the firstborn, the birthright. Esau comes in later after his hunt is over, only discovered that he had been duped, he'd been passed up. And, of course, he's furious. And you might say, well, why is he furious? You know, uh, at the beginning, he didn't give a rip. He didn't care. Well, that's what happens when you grow up, right? You start thinking about things a little differently. You see things uh, when you're a little older uh, differently than you did when you were younger. And what wasn't important then has suddenly become really important now. And so Esau's thinking, wait a minute. That's mine. I want that. That, that. that should be me. He was so angry that he vowed, when our father dies and the time for grieving is over, when the funeral is over, the casket is closed, buried, I'm going to kill that boy. I'm literally going to kill my brother. You see, what Jacob thought, the whole swap thing, was going to work to his advantage, made him a family fugitive. And after this incident, right here with their father, they would be separated. Isn't that what God said? These two will separate. They were separated for over 20 years. They wouldn't see each other for 20 years. When Jacob finally comes back home, and, of course, they, they both have big families and everything. And, and you know, they, they sort of patch things up. But you know, you know who Jacob never saw again? His mom. There's nothing in Scripture that says after this particular point, when they devised this scheme and pulled it off, that they, never, that they ever saw each other again. Man, think about that. That mom that loved him so much and that he loved so much that it went so far as to deceive uh, you know, her husband and his father. It destroyed their relationship. It destroyed. It tore apart this family. And, and all of this destruction, all of this dysfunction comes from one individual and his ongoing efforts to try to get ahead and, and grasp to claim what God had already done promised man isn't that crazy but the problem is with Jacob is the same that we often fight we just don't seem to trust God in his timing we're unwilling to wait now I don't want to leave you on a low note and we'll wrap things up right now uh, there is a silver lining to Jacob's story Genesis chapter 28 Jacob has his first, and I think, life-changing personal encounter with God. It's a turning point in his life. Just like perhaps when you came to Christ or when I met Jesus. That moment, everything begins to change. And things begin to move in a different direction. It's there in Genesis 28 that Jacob has a dream. And in this dream, he sees what looks to him like a staircase that connects heaven and earth. And on that staircase, he says, I see angels ascending and descending, up and down, up and down, up and down. And he's wondering, like, what, is, what does all this mean? But he knows this is special. Like, this is, this is a holy place. This is a holy moment. God is here. And it's then that God reassures Jacob of that covenant promise. He tells him, Jacob, you can trust me. You can trust my timing. You can trust my will, my plan, my word. Everything will be as I have said. And he gives Jacob some keys to how to truly get ahead. Not by his own means, but in a godly way. And, 
And these won't come up on the screen, so if you want them uh, later, you can just email me or shoot me a message. But, but God teaches Jacob, and I think he learns the lesson uh, by and large. God teaches Jacob, if you really want to get ahead, if you want to succeed in life, you got to have the faith to trust me, trust my person. In other words, the character and the nature of God. you got to trust the promise of God, believing that what I say I will do, I will do. You have to trust in the presence of God, that I will be with you. It doesn't matter what's going on around you or what your circumstances look like or how lonely you feel. I am there. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Even when you are faithless, I am faithful. Jacob Trust me. Trust in the power of God. Trust that not only what I said I will do, I will do, but that I have the power, I have the ability to do it. See, that's where we often miss it. Paul reminds us of that in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, where he said, He who began a good work in you, he will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus, until the end of it all. God is responsible for the outcome. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, again, I want you to read the rest of Jacob's story this week, starting in Genesis 25 through the rest of the book. And what you'll discover is that what God promised that he said he would do, he did. Jacob's life continued to be, as perhaps ours will be at times, full of struggle, occasional heartaches, But through it all, he learned to trust God. And in the end, this is what the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 was referring to. In the end, God blessed him with sons. Twelve of them, in fact. And those twelve sons became the twelve tribes of Israel. And from those twelve tribes became a great nation. God was faithful even when Jacob was deceptive and faithless. And so here's where that ties into us. I don't know what it is you may be believing God for, what your heart is yearning for, what it is that you desire most. I just want to remind you this morning, Psalm 37, 4 says, if you will delight yourself in the Lord, in other words, you will commit yourself to Him and His ways, He will give you, he will fulfill the desires of your heart. Maybe Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 is a little more familiar. Trust in the Lord always. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him. That is to trust him. Trust his timing. Trust his his timetable. Trust his faithfulness, his character, his ability. Trust him, and he will direct your path in other words he'll direct your footsteps that's the big lesson that's the big takeaway don't try to don't try to to push the plan down the road don't try to get ahead of God trust him his ways his timetable his ability some of you may be thinking you know I just want my business to get ahead I I just want to I want to finally sort of make it and feel like I I am successful. There's nothing wrong with that. Hey, that's a great goal. But just be careful how you go about it. There's no room for deception. There's no room for cheating. There's no room for overpricing and underperforming. And some of you, you're, you're yearning. We're talking about this marriage conference. You're yearning for love. Maybe you're single or, or, or single again, and you're thinking, if God would just bring somebody into my life, I, I feel like that that's what he wants for me, and, and, and that's what I want for sure, but, but just, I got no leads here. Listen, don't try to go about finding a mate, a spouse, in the wrong way, in the wrong places. Allow God to bring that person into your life, who loves you, who loves him, who will bless your life instead of break it. Maybe you're struggling in your marriage. Oh, if, if he would just do this or if she would do, do that, 
Trust God and His ability. Stop trying to change your wife. Stop trying to manipulate your husband. Trust God and His ability to do what needs to be done in their heart to make them become the husband, the wife that He wants them to be. That's not the rapture, folks. I'm still here. You don't have anything to worry about. You see what I'm saying? That was God's uh, sign to say, shut up. Let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you so much for your word, for your encouragement. Lord, we vow today to leave here today faithful people, trusting you. Lord, we can, we can depend on, we can rely on your character and person and your promises. So, Lord, today, do in us and through us what only you can do. God, help us become everything that you created us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you next week.